Brian, can you see what's on my screen? Assessing triage? Yeah. Great. Okay, great. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. Thank you so much. This has been a project going on for almost six months now, going from all the way all over New York State, from Buffalo to Syracuse, into the capital of New York, Albany. And now I'm here in Boston, Massachusetts, talking about what is going on with coronavirus COVID-19. So again, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is LaQueen Battle. You guys know me on Facebook, on YouTube, LinkedIn. I am a certified medical assistant. I have been in the medical field for over 18 years. I'm currently doing research on the coronavirus, COVID-19, and I have worked with legislators in Albany, Albany, New York, as well as in um, here, going to a uh, weekly press briefings with Mayor Marty Wash. So I'm very happy to be here tonight. So I will try to get this um, sent over to the staff at in Albany at the capital of New York, as well as Governor Cuomo. Maybe he'll be able to hear his staff. Um, so a couple of senators and assembly people in New York, as well as Chicago, and here in Boston, they'll be able to see see what their input is, as well as DC. Try to get the word out of what hospitals can do to help manage COVID patients versus regular everyday in normal emergencies. So the title of my presentation today is called Assessing Triage for COVID-19 Patients. I hope you guys can understand it. Now, believe me, as well as Brian, he's right there behind me. He's my assistant. If you guys have any questions, or Brian, if you have any questions, if, and Ira, I was going to join me later. If you guys have any kind of questions, please don't hesitate to ask me and just simply put, send your, your input as well, okay? So we're going to go ahead. This is the first, my title page of the presentation, Assessing Triage for COVID-19 Patients. Okay, so first of all, I want to give a, uh, what time is it, Brian? What time is it right now? It is, let's see, 7.09. Great, great. Okay, so uh, we're going to work with editing in this and getting this recorded and all of that. First of all, I want to give um, a shout out, thank you. I want to give a shout out to all these organizations who have been a part of the COVID-19 epidemic crisis, as well as our current administration in office um, here in uh it's Charlie Baker, right? Charlie Baker, as well as Marty Wash, the mayor of Boston, um, Ben Wash, the mayor of Syracuse, um, all the congressmen, all the assembly people that have been a part of this, as well as the global, global, global organizations, Governor Andrew Cuomo, Governor J.B. Prisker, Governor um, Greg Abbott of Texas, and who's the, who's the governor of California? Really good question. Okay, well, all the all the big cities that have been a part of the governor of New Jersey, all the big organizations and the big cities that have, have been a part of this coronavirus epidemic, I just want to say thank you as well as to the gentleman right here in the very center, Dr. Tedros Adham uh, Gabresis. <laughs> Gabresis. I know it's kind of kind of difficult to say, but he looks just like my daddy. So. Um, I want to thank you to all these organizations that are part of the medical community as well as the national emergency community um, who pretty much need, are out there to help out with emergencies. So the World Health Organization, I want to give a shout out to the World Health Organization for helping me present this presentation today. They are always involved. They have a history of epidemics of Ebola, swine flu, chicken flu, um, the AIDS epidemic all around the world. And now the World Health Organization is, has this president, Dr. Tedros, even though he has a com controversial relationship with, with President Trump, still at the same time, we need to honor and give recognition to Dr. Tedros and the World Health Organization. The CDC Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health, the American Medical Association, the Department of Health and Human Services, NDC, the National Guard, and all the armed forces of the United States that have been a part of this epidemic, helping set up facilities, helping set up temporary hospitals, United Way, Catholic Charities, as well as to um, all the organizations that have been, been a part of what is going on right now with COVID-19. So we're just going to give you a shout out. Thank you to all the organizations. All right. So now I'm going to briefly have, oh, okay. Brief, brief, briefly, I'm going to briefly share this video about, it's a brief video saying why am I here and why am I doing this presentation today from downtown Boston and why, you guys should check out my YouTube video, why I'm doing this here. So briefly, briefly, it's, it's very quickly, very quickly, brief video, okay? All right, so try to play this. There we go. So just guys, briefly, briefly go on this with me. Oh, one second. I'm just waiting for this video to start. <laughs> Guys, bear with me, bear with me. There we go. Hmm. I got it, I got it, I got it. This is also on my YouTube channel. Okay. 
Good. Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Okay. It's a brief delay of some people, but bear with me, okay? It's still a little delay. It's still a little delay, right? It's better now. Okay. Okay, so briefly, the, the video continues on, on YouTube and Facebook as well. That's why the reason why I'm here, I'm having a compassionate, compassionate um, understanding about what's going on with COVID patients, as well as having the personal um, story about how it happened to me. And like I finished at the end of the video, when I was diagnosed with COVID about six weeks ago here in the Boston area, you can literally feel the fever on me, how hot, how hot my temperature was on my body, how hot my external body temperature was. And so that's why I really want to share with people um, 
as a COVID patient and as a medical professional, it's important for me to get help, important for me to get emergency care in the hospital. But at the same time, though, hospitals still have other emergency issues as a medical professional that they still need to need to assess. Okay. All right. So now we're going to go on to the next next slide. So who this is. Was an audio in here? No, there was an audio in here. So this is pretty much very important. Like I was saying, the hospitals right now, even though the rates, I should have put the, the COVID curve in here, even though the rates were going lower and lower and less people are catching or are actually coming, are recovering from COVID, still at the same time though, hospitals need to assess what is more important. Now, as of 2020, 2019, the primary cause of death in the United States is not COVID-19, coronavirus. It is not any kind of infection disease. The primary cause of death in, in, as of the United States is heart disease. Heart disease, hypertension, hyper, hypertension, heart disease. That is the main primary cause of death in the United States as of 2019, 2020. And so hospitals need to focus on Big issues like heart disease, lung cancer, hypertension, diabetes, strokes, as well as the COVID virus, even though the coronavirus as of yet has impacted, what, 340,000 people died all over the world. And we, that is a very important issue to address, to address one, one, two million people have been diagnosed positive with COVID cases. Over 300, 400,000 people have died as of May. 24, 2020, coronavirus is still a very important issue. At the same time, though, we have other emergency care issues to address. Like I said before, heart disease, a stroke. Stroke is a very big issue that needs needs to be a, needs to be addressed, especially in the minorities community and the Black and Latino and and other communities. A very big issue, heart disease and stroke. You'd be surprised how many people are having strokes now, how young they are. So those are very, uh, very important as well as diabetes, other kind of emergency cares that need to be ad addressed as well as dealing with COVID. So this chart right here is it is pretty much saying it is easy to become complacent about vital signs, which is primarily the reason why, as a medical professional, we need to figure out what is this patient coming into the hospital for? How can we properly assess them and still diagnose them with, is this a regular emergency care? Or is this actually a coronavirus that we can dictate and isolate into its own kind of arena? Okay, it is easy to become complacent about vital signs when the recording is seen very much as a task to be undertaken rather than a key clinical skill in putting patient safety first. Primarily, from Nursery Times Online in 2009. Primary, 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 primary focus in, Amer in hospitals all around the world, infection control, disease control, uh, disease containment is key, but the primary, primary reason why we want to help patients and help emergency care patients is primarily, primary for patient safety. That should be the number one issues in hospitals dealing with today. Patient safety should be number one, especially when you're dealing with COVID patients versus regular emergency patients. How can I best assess this person's situation at the same time, isolate Isolate the emergency from that person and that, that individual person in their situation at the same time. How do I isolate the disease, isolate the infection, and still take care of that person's well-being and at, at, at their best well-being and their quality of life? How do I best protect somebody's quality of life? So patient safety is key as well as taking care of other issues. We want to take care of patient safety, we want to take care of their mental mental, mental health, their mental well-being, as well as, like I said before, addressing other issues. Right now, potential for human error is high. Working with vitals, working, assessing these patients that are coming into the hospital, into clinics, into emergency rooms, into doctor's offices, Right now, the main issue is, okay, the rates are going lower, but at the same time, I'm a, I'm a medical assistant. I've been a nurse aide. I'm not a certified nurse aide, but I've been a nurse aide. I've been a home health care aide. I've done, um, license, I've done uh, clinical nursing skills. At the same time, any, any kind of error in my 
measurements and my temperature measurements and my blood pressure readings, any kind of error in my blood pressure, my manual blood pressure readings, if the provider, if the doctor has to go back and redo a blood pressure reading over my blood pressure meeting, that means that that patient can actually have hypertension instead of a normal reason, and therefore that can impact their quality of care. So it's very important when you're working with these COVID patients to have exactly the right kind of measurements as needed. So say for instance, somebody comes to the hospital, I do a, temp, temp, a head a head um, therm, therm, a head thermometer reading. That head tympanic tympanic right tympanic. Thank you, Brian. That head tympanic reading reads ninety eight point nine, which is a normal reading. But if I do an I do a nas um, an ear cavity reading, that reading reads one hundred and two point three. That's how quick of an error it can impact somebody's life and it can impact their quality of care. So we have to be sure that we are getting accurate readings working with this COVID patients as well as regular patients. Now we have to address the situation, okay? First of all, when a patient comes into the emergency room, we have to figure out, diagnose, what are they here for? What was the situation? What kind of, what kind of previous medications have they had? Uh, what have they ate or drank today, and what is the emergency about? That's a primary reason. What is the emergency about? What is their previous medications? What is their previous hist medical history say? Are they diabetic? Have they had heart disease? Have they had cancer? What are they here for? What is the emergency? We have to address the emergency at the same time. Be sure to take accurate, accurate measures, accurate measurements, vital measurements when we're working with these patients. Sometimes you can diagnose, misdiagnose a COVID patient when it really is a heart patient. So you can say somebody has a, a, a high temperature of 102, but that patient also has a history of heart attacks and strokes. So you take that heart attack stroke, that stroke patient to the COVID, COVID unit when they really should automatically go to the heart unit and get emergency care and emergency CPR assistance. Okay, so we really have to figure out how do I best isolate this, this situation, look at the patient history at the same time, though, figure out what is their most important issue to address. So we can't just pretty much basically isolate COVID patients and everybody is a COVID patient. There are other prior existing conditions out there that have, way, that have more impact as well as infectious diseases. Okay, you can have a lung cancer patient also with a high temperature, also with a respiratory illness, but that patient is not only a COVID patient, that patient is a cancer patient. So you need to address the cancer issue first before you address the infectious disease issue second. That's why we need to make sure that we have accurate errors and accurate accurate readings when we're working with all kind of patients. Make sure that we know their prior history, any prior existing conditions. You guys, you understand me? Brian, you got me? Good, good. <laughs> Say yes, I can see your head face. Yeah. Okay, exactly. So I'm a medical assistant. What I do is I assess patients, they come into my care, and then I provide them over to the assistants of the provider, the nurse practitioner, the RN, the doctor, the physician, the doctor of uh, osteopathy, the DL, the MD. I take their assessments and then I hand them over to the doctor or to the nurse practitioner or to the higher, higher authorizing personnel than me. Okay, so the patient's first point of contact is my point of contact. Whether you're a, PC, a PCT, an RN, a CMA, a nurse aide, a certified nurse aide, whatever, whoever that person's first point of contact, that first point of contact has to get the proper, proper assessment. So you can even be an EMT, and an EMT can be that first person's first point of contact, okay? And if there's any kind of incorrect readings with that EMT or that nurse aide or a medical assistant, you can impact that person's life. That's why I say you want to make sure that you get the proper, proper assessment and the proper readings. Right here in the last, on the last, the last, the last right here, it's called a primary assessment. It's very quick and very fast. It's a rapid initial First, the initial examination of a patient to recognize and to manage all immediate life-threatening conditions. So I can have a COVID patient or I can have a heart disease patient. I can have a COVID patient or I can have a diabetic patient that's about to go into a coma because the sugar is way too low or way too high. 
okay? I can have a COVID patient or I can have a patient on dialysis, kidney dialysis. So what's more important, the dialysis or the COVID? That's what we have to, that's why we have to address all, all right here at the very bottom, all immediate life-threatening conditions. You got me, guys? So the rates, the COVID rates may go low at the same time that person's life-threatening condition is primary, the primary level, level, level five. The COVID is a level three, but that person's heart condition, that person's dialysis condition, that person's kidney condition is a level five. So we have to make sure that it is equal and balanced and address the, the, the higher level first, okay? Now, I have some audio here, some interviews that I did here in the Boston area. This is what hospitals are going to do. So guys, just listen to me right quick. See how you feel. See if you can understand. And Brian, I am taking your feedback as well. Okay? <laughs> Say something. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is, is about uh, 35 seconds long. Okay. Where are you at? Where are you at? Okay. Play. Okay, as you can see, he said there's there still will not be barriers to go into the hospital emergency care. Is that what you got from Brian? Is that what you got from the from um yeah. what did you get from that 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 excerpt that excerpt? His priority is his own care and that he basically um you know regardless of what the media um is portraying, he would definitely trust the healthcare system and go ahead and take care of himself. Exactly, exactly. So Look at, look at these pictures, both picture on the left and the right. On the left is an American hospital and on the right is, an, is a Chinese hospital. Look how blocked up and filled to capacity both these hospitals are. You have Americans on the left and Chinese on the right. And you can see the Mandarin, the Mandarin writing in the background. The Mandarin's right here. Okay, the Mandarin. You see the Mandarin are Korean. Both hospitals and both, look at these patients waiting right here to get help. These hospitals are filled up to maximum capacity. So a regular emergency room can only fit up to about 200 people, at, at the most 100 people, maximum capacity. These people are waiting in the halls, sitting down on the floor, trying to get the same emergency medical care. And yet the, the, the gentleman that I had an interview with said, he even if he was going through emergency, a life-threatening emergency, it still would not get prevent him from getting care. So when we're working with COVID patients, yes, COVID-19 is a big emergency. It's affecting their breathing. It's affecting their respiratory system. They can't breathe. They have high temperatures. They're going through shock, shock. Their whole body's about to shut down. We have to put them on respirators. At the same time, though, hospitals have to isolate this, this global and nationwide emergency, isolate the respiratory, isolate all these conditions from primary primary con existing conditions all of this is emergency this all of this is a right now emergency both left and right these are both right now immediate immediate emergencies with COVID patients still though even though it's an immediate emergency most of this woman right here that's in the pink in the pink blanket she may have a pre-existing condition of heart failure 
So what's more important, to focus on the respiratory issue or to focus on the heart failure? That's why hospitals have to figure out a balance between what is primary, her primary level of care for focus. What is our primary, what, how do we address our primary issue, our primary focus? Her respiratory system is, her. she's in failure right now. She's going through shock. Her body is shutting down. At the same time, not only is her body shutting down, but her heart is about to shut down. So she has two double whammies right there. And automatically, somebody with a pre-existing condition and with COVID can immediately die, just like that. And it's very important for hospitals to focus and to find a balance between heart disease, between strokes, between diabetes, as well as COVID, which is a, a global emergency, and find out a way to balance that so that we will not cause double shock upon patients. Upon patients. Even though the rates are, excuse me, can, I, can you give me a, a thank you. I'm going to my eye. Even though the rates of transmission are going lower and lower, okay, patients that are coming into the facilities, okay, are getting double shocks. They have pre-existing conditions, and they are also going through a, a, a right now emergency. So it's very important that, especially when now, as of, as of April, May 2020, People are afraid to go to hospitals. So when they do enter into emergency rooms, it's already stage three, stage four. It's already life-threatening. Threat threatening. So hospitals are not able to provide any further emergency care because it's already a life or death situation. That's why it's very important to figure out how do hospitals find the balance between right now emergency care versus pre-existing level five emergencies. Understand where I'm coming from? You got me, Brian? Okay. All right, the next slide. That's the same guy, that's the same guy. That's the same, that's the same interview. As I said before, he says it will not impact him. But when you go to the hospital, you see the hospital anyway with people that are going through, have, have this, um, Contagious viral illness will stop a lot of people from going to the hospitals, which is basically what is going on right now with so many celebrity deaths on the news, as well as what's going on in the general public. People are afraid to go to the hospitals. They are afraid to catch illnesses. They are afraid to catch, they're afraid to get help because they might catch at a hospital and it's a life or death situation. So this is very, very important. Like I said before, patient safety. Patient safety is very important. Focusing on their quality of life care, focusing on the right now situation, or focusing on their on their condition, on their emotional condition, on their mental condition. I'm just going to say a couple of bullet points here. Patient safety is a discipline that emphasizes safety in healthcare through the prevention, okay, prevention, preventive care, reduction, reporting, and analysis of medical error that often leads to adverse effects. The frequency and magnitude of avoidable adverse e events experienced by patients was not well known until the 1990s when multiple countries reported staggering numbers of patients harmed and killed by medical errors. Medical errors could be, oh, oh my God, we left a needle in somebody's body, or we, we had the, the wrong measurements, or, or we, we took off the wrong limb on the, right, on the right side of the body when it should have been on the left side of the body. And so you can have patient errors through COVID patients. Oh, yes, you can. There's, there's, there should be plenty, there can be plenty of medical errors with COVID patients that have not been reported to the media. Now, recognizing that healthcare errors impact one in every 10 patients around the world, the World Health Organization calls patient safety an endemic concern. Indeed, patient safety has emerged as a distinct healthcare discipline supported by an immature yet developing scientific framework. This is from the Wikipedia article on patient safety. So that's what I'm trying to address. If you do not address a patient's prior existing conditions at a higher level than COVID, that can be an issue of patient safety. You can put that person's life at risk if you do not address any kind of prior existing conditions. That's why it's important to get their emotional health, their mental health, as well as any kind of physical ailments, any kind of family history that may impact a person's quality of life care, as well as emerg emergent respiratory viral infection. It is still very important to focus on 
COVID respiratory illness. At the same time, though, patient care, patient safety, preventing any kind of uh, problems with measurements, preventing any kind of wrong quality of care, leaving patients on the floor, hitting, beating up nursing room patients. I mean, it's been reported in all of the patient safety. You, you, you cannot hurt these patients. Everybody's the same, whether they're a, a normal patient, whether they're an older 65-year-old person, or whether they're an 18-year-old young adult diagnosed with COVID-19. Everybody should receive the higher, the same quality of care, but it is not so. It is not so, and that is a shame. That is a shame. So right here, it says assessing, what does that say, Brian? I can't see it. Accessing vital signs. Accessing vital signs. Now, as a medical assistant, my job is to assess vital signs. I help right here, first bullet, I have measure basic body functions, uh, monitor medical, medical problems. And what it is is that this, the doctors, the nurses, the registered nurses, the LPNs, all the technicians, all the manage, clinical management uses these as tools to help with patients care. Now, vital signs, it can be any kind of trigger or basically anything that the patient is telling me I have to report to the doctor. So any kind of ailments, whether it is, oh, I've had a, I've ha I'm taking blood pressure medication, I'm taking hydrochlorothiazide, or I'm on di kidney dialysis, or um, I forgot to check my sugar this morning. And you have a person come to the hospital with a 104 degree fever, and they forgot to check their, their, their sugar this morning. They forgot to check their sugar in the last two weeks. What's more important? You got to take care of that, that fever first. But at the same time, though, you cannot forget, I see right there, you cannot forget, um, you cannot forget that patient's prior existing condition. Five minutes until 40. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to briefly get into it. Is it telling me that I don't have a lot of time yet? Uh, depending on whether or not it cuts off. Uh, okay. I'm just giving you thank you okay so guys this is the first part of the series if it does cut off you guys will follow me on next sunday when i finish this because i'm going to continue to, to post this on eventbrite and let you guys know what's up now um there's some more thank you brian these are some more interviews and like that like i said guys this has been a three-week series this has been a three-week going on series i will continue guys to update this update you guys and let you know what is going on as I continue to work on my presentation skills, figure out what's going on. This has been, this has not just been in one day. It's taken me weeks and weeks to get this. And I'm still trying to get this together and help process this as well. So here are some more interviews that I've did about what's going on. Follow the pictures and, and listen, listen to the people speak here in Boston. <laughs> so yes and brian can you follow me what did you get back from that from that from that interview 
<clears throat> just the healthcare worker getting um, frustrated with the logistics tied to uh, his own place of employment. I mean, the fact that he's able to work somewhere but not receive the same services at the exact same location based on kind of the illogical thought process tied to the protocol that's in place for his own protection, for everyone else's protection. Um, and, you know, I could just sense the fear and anxiety in his voice, um, but more frustration than anything else and just kind of exhaustion associated with, you know, having to be a healthcare professional that can't even get his basic needs met. Exactly. Now, I imagine he's a hospital worker. He's a healthcare professional. He says, this lady on the right, he does this the same procedure. Okay. He's, he has a, he has a 12 hour shift and he's been doing the same procedure, ventilators, hospital masks, seeing patients live and some die every single day for the past six weeks. Okay. On 12 hour shifts. Seeing patients come to the hospital just like this. Here on the left, on the right is Italy, and on the left is um, the Middle East. Okay, imagine seeing this every every single day when you go to work and trying to be a patient in the same hospital at the same time. And he's a veteran. Can you imagine what he's going through? It's a conflict of interest. It's a conflict. It's a conflict because you could be a healthcare worker and still be a patient at the same time. And there are so many healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, medical technicians, support personnel that are dying of the same illness that are, they are trying to cure. It's a conflict, it's, it's an unbalance. And it's really sad, it is really, really sad. <clears throat> it is really, really, really sad. Now I'm gonna make a brief introduction and then we're just gonna, um, um, I don't know how long that, um, what is it, Zoom is going to keep me on for today? Yeah, it might not kick you off. It might not, click, it might not click me off? No, I just know that typically there's like a 40 minute restriction. So that's what Good, okay. Well, we'll see how Zoom does me. That's the clean battle. <laughs> and I, I'm going to make a quick, this is a quick brief interlude. And I think the next two slides, Brian, is, is an intermission. So we're going to take a quick break, okay? So it's, it's a long presentation, but I'm glad that I was able to get help from Brian, Mr. Trigger, Trigger, as well as help you guys assess and analyze what is really going on, what is really go going on, okay? So this is a brief introduction, and I just, guys, continue to listen, continue to listen. Okay. I'm briefly explaining myself again and again. <laughs> I'm trying to get to the point, let me. Okay, so I'm gonna cut it there because I'm just pr pretty much explaining the same thing. You guys have seen the same picture posted all over social media. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, is there any audio on this slide or no? Mm, there should have been. There should have been? Okay. Um, My mistake. It's okay, don't worry about it. Um, if you, can you open the door a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. So pretty much this is what's going on in Boston. Hospital, thank you, just a little bit, thank you. Hospital rooms are filled to capacity right now and emergency personnel are waiting. So you have some hospitals that are empty and you have some hospitals that are filled. And it's just, it's, it's still right now, as the rates are going down, you see these people clean up the mess that was left, the decontamination unit right here, and the emergency personnel EMS people, four EMS ambulances waiting on call, waiting to try to see where is best help needed. These EMS people have been trained in all kinds of emergencies and all kinds of medical um, BLS basic life services. But when emergency personnel are seeing the same thing over and over and over again of COVID patients, of people with respiratory problems, of people with flu, of people with shock, of people with fevers, that is an issue. Then it becomes, why is my career focused on respiratory illnesses and, and respiratory diseases 
and viral illnesses when it should be focused on a general general around health epidemic. I have a general health ed education. I'm here for general emergencies. I wasn't trained to do just just infectious diseases. I was trained to provide general em basic emergency care. And when you're dealing with, okay, get where I'm saying, guys, get where I'm going. If you are dealing with viral patients, viral infectious diseases, every single day of your career, that can impact the healthcare professional's life. And the healthcare professionals, they can affect their health too as well. And they can be exposed to the illness at a double, triple times worse and their symptoms could be even off worse or it could be a life or death situation for the healthcare workers that are trying to help out the patients that have the disease because they are exposed to the disease every single day and you cannot expect that a vaccine will, will stop you from from getting an illness when you are exposed to the illness every single day no matter how much PPE or gear you may have as a nurse or a doctor or a medic or any kind of medical per per personnel, understand, you cannot expect that a PPE or gear, that mask, that gloves, that double glove, you can double glove it, you can triple glove it, you can put as much protection, as much barriers in front of you to block you from COVID patients. But if you are working with viral infectious diseases every single day of your career, please best believe that that gear will not protect you 100% from catching the disease. That's why it's very, very important for them to rotate for these doctors and these nurses and these medic professionals to get a break, to take a break, to get relief and to get tested themselves. They work around this illness 24 hours a day, especially an EMS person. They need to get tested as well, if not every single week. It should be a part of their job and expect for them to also have quality of life care too. If they are patients, they should be treated the same as, a, as the people that they are working for. None the less and none the better. That's how it should work. You get me, Brian? You understand? Great, okay. All right, next slide. Where is the meat? Oh, here it is. Oh, I see it, it's on the left side. So here's another interview, an audio interview. This is one of the tents, the emergency tents that is COVID testing here. I think it's either at Tufts Hospital or Boston Medical Center here in the Boston area. Just listen, listen to this interview. Guys, listen to this interview. All right. Hello, And that lady has reserves. This tip right here is a temporary setting. It's a temporary set. And that lady has reserves, has financial problems at the same time set for temp temporary situations like herself. She has temporary money set aside for um, problems of unemployment, problems with paying her rent. At the same time too, hospitals should have tents like this set up as emergencies, as well as American Red Cross Salvation Army on call, on hand, on call and ready to assist um, hospitals and all the facilities when the when when glo when a global crisis and an epidemic happens. Okay. All right. 
So here is, this is, I was a patient, I was a COVID patient. I've been tested five times, I was negative once. And at the Newton Pavilion by Boston Medical Center is where I received treatment. And they provided great care. I was in a hospital, the unit for only a week, great care, clean facility. And I also did an interview uh, here in Boston to talk a little bit about with somebody else relating to what's going on with COVID. So guys, continue to listen with me on this. <laughs> So she's saying the hospital that the economy might come back up, up, up again in the fall. In the fall, <laughs> but the, these facilities right here, as you saw, the tent before that was a temporary tent. But these pavilions, these these hospital buildings are permanently were permanently built to uh, to have different specialties come in. Okay, but at the same time, this permanent building fixture has been completely cleaned out and completely wiped away from all patients, all kind of doctors and primary use for COVID patients. So again, they're saying, oh, we might come back to regular hospital use in the fall. Now just imagine how much money and how much time and energy hospitals are wasting, how much money they are, are is using up just for COVID patients, which is not a problem, but it still is another issue that hospitals have to address. Okay. So as a medical assistant, my primary function is to assess proper, proper vitals for patients. I have to make sure I have the correct temperature, the heart rate, the blood pressure, make sure that their mentality, their level of consciousness is correct, make sure that they're continually getting regular urine output, as well as making sure that their oxygen is correct. Now, if any issues of these right here is addressed, that can affect that patient's quality of care in their life. And usually, and most of these, these bullet points are, are, param are parameters for diagnosis whether a patient has COVID or not. And I made a quick, quick video about it. Sorry. Thank you, Brian, for staying with me. <laughs> Guys, continue to listen. Continue, continue.
Okay, so um, examine how important each of these vital assessments is. If there is a mistake and error, you can impact somebody's pretty much life situation, so life or death situation, as well as checking for urine output. Okay, I know it's eight o'clock, Brian. No, I'm just gonna grab some water. Gonna go ahead, go ahead, grab some water, it's okay. So um, here's another interview I did. The uh, Boston, uh, city of Boston has mass de decontamination units. Oh, this is so cute. It's pretty much helping set up and de, de deprocess what is going on right now with the COVID situation. So you have the fire department, the police department is coming in here, trying to clean up and, and clean up every single hospital situation. That's why they call it a decontamination unit. They come to the hospitals, they sanitize everything, and they make sure that any kind of further illness is not spread. Any kind of viral contagion is not spread further on in the hospitals or in the city of Boston. Okay, so it's very poor people are like, I'm afraid to go to the hospital because I might catch an illness. That's why the city, their local city departments have units like this set up to make sure that every single facility is clean and every single, every single facility is clean and sanitized and in order to prevent any kind of viral infection or any kind of viral contagion from, from, from spreading. So it shouldn't be an issue going to hospitals because you might catch something. Cities have this set up to, to prevent that from happening. And the guy's saying, he's, he's saying, I don't think so. I don't think that there's a future that lies ahead for me and my family. He said there's no future because it, this, this illness has caused so much sensation, so much contagion around people. It's lost jobs, businesses closing, homelessness. There's been a lot of issues with this spreading and spreading. A lot of people are afraid of going to the hospital. So it is a very, very big issue. Okay. And here's a, here is another tent that was set up. And I'm lucky, thankful that um, the city of Boston and Boston Medical Center and Tufts Medical Center has these temporary, temporary uh, testing sites set up to help people, okay? So listen to this interview. See, she's a hospital worker, and she said it should affect the quality of care from patients versus doctors. It's very important, very, 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 very issue. Here's another interview that I did. See, there's the, the, the Boston, city of Boston uh, uh, health care department, public health department. <laughs> And even as a pregnant woman, going to the hospital is going to impact her labor and delivery. See how see how crazy that is? And she's she says she she can only can only can have two visitors in her only have her husband in the living room and not her family. And this is not regulated by the hospitals. This is regulated by right here, right here, right here, the depart the city's Department of Health. 
Every single hospital has their own facility, own management to address issues, but this is actually regulated by every single local facilities Department of Health. It's crazy. And then the hospitals follow. The hospitals follow. So Brian and, and people, if you want to just sit back, this is the intermission. Do you have any reflections about what's going on? And Brian, can, can you tell me briefly what you have learned from this so far? Hmm, just that there's a contrast between the pulse of what's uh, really going on that you're touching into and mm -hmm. what's being portrayed on the media. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that there's definitely, uh, you know, if, if someone were to turn on the news, whether it's CNN, Fox, or a variety of other um, broadcasting stations, uh, they're going to get a much different picture of really what's going on versus kind of listening to you uh you know your interviews these are kind of real people um you know on the ground floor and what they're going through and you know some people have some serious concerns that you know aren't being addressed mm -hmm. so i mean that those are the first kind of few thoughts that pop into my head when i'm listening to to the audio i did get the impact of that and i really appreciate you saying that um it's very important that is very important everything you just said and um, and the media has to address it you are absolutely right the media has to address the overall picture and people are concerned about it it is a very big issue so i completely understand that thank you brian all right so uh right now um i'm we are uh how many slides do we have left which slide are we on reflections yeah no but just uh does it show the number let me I see think, oh so we're we have 20 left we have 20 left so guys do you want to continue do you want to continue it's up to you. Might as well, because I think I thank you, Zoom, for letting me continue to share. <laughs> thank you, Zoom. I really appreciate your time. So I'm going ahead and try to get this quick. I got 20 slides left. Make every single interview. Thank you to the city of Boston. Thank you, Mayor Marty Rush. And we are going to continue, or we can stop from here and we'll we'll just go ahead and continue. So this is another interview that I had here in Boston. Okay. <laughs> He said it's miserable. The economy is miserable. There's another interview I did. This is outside of Tufts University, Boston Medical, here in Chicago. Here's another one. Look how the differences in facilities. The left one here is on China how they're building these permanent facilities for a temporary condition, was was with it, which is what's going on right now in the United States. They're building huge, huge, huge arenas just for COVID patients. <laughs> look, look, there's no future. Look, the hospitals are building these multi-million dollar facilities and the people and the citizens are saying there's no future for our families, there's a future for us. And most of these arenas, both the convention center on the right and these big facilities on the left, are going to be completely bare empty. All this money that the cities and the governments have wasted just to build facilities that are going to be empty as the rates lower and lower. It is ridiculous. And peop the people, the citizens are saying there is no future for us. No future. So like I said before, potential for human error is extremely high. That's why every single medical professional has to make sure that they take care and assess the whole total totality of the, per of the, of the patient's condition. Check all their pre-existings all their pre-existing conditions, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, high weight, low weight, everything, previous pregnancies, every single thing. Now, you could, what are some of your concerns when a patient's vitals are dangerously rushed through and they are not properly assessed? And a lot of medical clinical personnel are rushing through COVID patients, rushing through COVID patients. Okay, we're gonna get their blood pressure, their temperature, that's it. Blood pressure, temperature, respiratory, that's it. And they are missing the vital details that are necessary to help people and help people's quality of care. They are missing the details. 
Here's another issue that I address. See, it's still, there are all this, all these nurses, all these medical professionals set up these tents, all these different isolation wards. That's, that's very important. They still not, will prevent them from getting, getting that care. Okay. What hospitals are going through on the left is a, is a doctor giving a tour of the facility. On the right is a patient covered in a blank, in a blanket of, what is this, Brian? What do you call this? Um, this is an incubator? A temporary incubator? Is that an incubator? That's what it looks like. It looks like an incu incubator cover, like a temporary incubator. Look how horrible this is. And the doctor on the left has explained how to perform these procedures, how, how this is necessary to be done. But look at that patient. That patient, it looks like they're already pronounced dead. Look how sad it is. And that's why I go to over abuse of power. There is an overabuse, and as a medical professional, it's ridiculous to see right here on the left. The, the hospital staff is just sitting. Look, look, they are sitting with their PP gear on, okay? Their PP gear is completely on, and you have a patient, a normal, normal a person right here walking down out with no, no gloves, no mask here on the, on the right. And you have the doctors covered up from head to toe in emergency in a PPE gear, personal protective gear, when they should be completely, this could, should be completely off, uncovered, no gloves, no gown, no mask. This, this N95, with all of this PPE gear off should be completely off. What they're doing is they're transferring all the virus, all of the, the secretions, every little drop that they've been working with, onto this lady right here. Look how many doctors are, one professional, personal, one, two, three, four, five. Every single thing on their PPE gear can be transferred to this lady. And she may not even know she's sick till three, four weeks later and figure out where and how she got it from. This right here is a, is a da dangerous. And right here, you have military facilities blocking hospital access for people that need emergencies. Right here is another over abuse of, of power. So potential for human error is extremely high. And you can you can affect somebody and give them COVID-19 as a medical professional and not even know it. And that's another cause for human error. So you have to make sure that you are following every single procedure that is spoken to you and that is instructed for you to do. Just common sense. Listen to this interview. <laughs> And yes, there is a future for people dealing with these illness. This guy has an incubator on his face and his other personal is sitting here in the hospital and no, not one single nursing staff has a mask on. This, was, this probably was in the early stages of the disease. And, they, and, the, and the nurse, this, the person I just got through speaking to, the nurse or the doctor physician, she said, yeah, hospitals are doing a great job. They're doing as much as they can with the limited resources that are available to them. That's why training 
weekly training, daily training, daily press, daily teaching briefs, daily meetings, staff meetings are necessary for medical professionals to be informed about what changes are going on. You have to continue to attend the staff meetings, continue to be informed, continue to go through the trainings, online trainings. You have to because it's not necessary for your, for your profession. It is necessary for your health. So anytime you get an email or a staff meeting or an announcement, please don't just take that for lightly. Please, please don't take that lightly. It's actually for your own health and safety. So it's very, very important to be informed. It is very important to be informed. <laughs> it's very, very, very important to be informed. So like I said, what are your, some of your concerns when, it, when something is, is rushed through and not properly assessed? Right here is, is what it has to be properly assessed when you're dealing with somebody as a medical professional, as a CNA, as a nurse, as a nurse aide, as a medical assistant, as a phlebotomy technician, as any kind of, med as well as a doctor, you have to assess the, the patient's overall system. Every single human body function as possible, their liver, their stomach, their kidneys, their heart, their lungs, as well as their regular body rhythm, the lactic acidosis, their regular, the, the hematology. All you look at their whole body system when you're working with COVID because COVID patients, it affects their whole respiratory, upper respiratory system, as well as it affects the whole metabolism, the whole hemostasis of somebody's body. So you have to look at the patient as a whole instead of just as, oh, they have pneumonia. Look at their pre existings, look at their heart rate look at their temperature, look at their family life, look at their family history in order to determine what is the, what is the higher level of care, the pre-existing or the COVID. That's why it's very, very, very important to assess each and every single patient's medical history. Very important, their whole body, their whole entire medical, uh, medical history. So you can assess everything together rather, rather than just focusing on one issue. You can actually get every, all, all the issues taken care of at the same time with the right, right medical staff and personnel. And you can actually, two, two brains are better than one <laughs> most of the time. You can actually help somebody's whole entire system rather than just addressing, oh, she has a fever, oh, she has a cold. See how that works? You have to address the whole body. Again, and this is sorry, sorry was SARS, it's, it's a term that's used by SARS uh, the, in, in the World Health Organization. Uh, SARS is, is, as well as COVID are very similar. SARS came before, is a predetermined before COVID-19 coronavirus, and it shows pretty much the same basic systems, respiratory distress, cardio, cardio failure, their nerves, is instability in the nerve system, they, the patients having seizures, confusion, lethargy, they're tired, their mental functions are not alert, and the patients also having dehydration unable to drink, lethargy, they're very, and sucking eyes. So again, SARS is also, was a predetermined to right now what we're going through in 2019, 2020, COVID-19 coronavirus. And you have to, as a medical professional, as regular people, even first ACPR, you have to figure out, do your own research, look up and find out what it has previous medical professionals, researchers found out about previous illnesses and how does it relate to me going on today. So do your own research to be able to figure out what is really going on, as well as it shows the same symptoms that COVID patients have right now, SARS. SARS shows pretty much bas basically the same symptoms of coronavirus. And this right here is a European scale, dealing with TPR and the European scale. This is basically the same thing, TPR, as well as checking their oxygen and their respiratory rates and their level of consciousness, mental, mental stability. Uh, news, uh, the national early warning score is used by European hospitals and facilities, just like, the, just like TPR. Now, when TPR is used incorrectly, like I said, here's some examples. You can give somebody, do a, a, a fever check, a temperature check, an oral thermometer is used when a patient has serious high stages of, um, you can do a head reading versus an oral reading. And actually that person may be in high stages of pneumonia. So you can actually get an incorrect reading on their head versus through their nose or their mouth. You know, so these are pretty much the basic, some very basic, basic um, examples. I'm trying to briefly go through this. And again, dealing as a medical professional, you have the, you have the chest x-rays and pretty much the chest x-rays do show, give you that final, that final, final, final 
um, a result to show that patient has pneumonia. Usually it is always a chest x-ray to see if that person has pneumonia. If they have fever and cough, and you can see right here, the, the, the lungs and the heart is clouded. Look how cloudy this left lung is right here. Look how cloudy that is on the left side. Their left frame, their left axis. Their respiratory rate is, is less than 30, 30 beats per minute. Their, their oxygen is greater than 90% of air. That person's breathing. <sighs> their respiratory rate is fast. And they, they can't speak, and they can't even use their, their neck muscles or any kind of accessory muscles in their body. And therefore, you may cause a double stage pneumonia, and that person may actually go into shock and die. This right here talking about life you're saved. You can actually pr pr provide survival methods if you just take care of patients in, in the proper manner, assessing their whole, whole body. But what this is saying, it's talking about the principle of maximum life save, is what hospitals are doing, they're giving more, some hospitals are giving priority status, a higher level status to patients that are healthy versus patients that are sick. And you can't do that. You have to assess the, that's what the debate is for. Do I assess this normal patient first? This healthy patient, a healthy 35-year-old person versus a, an unhealthy diabetic 80-year-old person? I could take per, I could take I could take take care of this the healthy person faster than the older person. The older person may take long, so I need to get them last. No, that's not how it works. You need to take care of the person in priority status first. That's how it should work. You save both people at the same time, even, even though they have the same illness. So how will this help improve the quality of life? What I'm talking about today is pretty much is helping you assess what I need to do, how do I perform, how do I function as a medical professional, and how do I assess somebody's illness? What's more important for me to assess? COVID-19 are their prior existing conditions. What's more important? And you have to put both the prior, priors as well as the immediate on the same level and to assess what's more important. Of course, the priors are going to be more important, but right now the emergency care is COVID. So you got to take care of most patients that have COVID and have other prior existing conditions as well. So you have to address the whole body system. Understand where I'm coming from, Brian? You get me? Great. Do you have any questions so far, Brian? Great. Okay. Again, this is talking about the life, life cycle principle, which is what a lot of doctors and hospitals use. And like I was talking about before, you should address everybody, especially the people that have major illnesses first. It says any age-based prioritization should rely on broad life stages. No, notion of equality to individuals' whole lifetime experiences rather than, than just their current situation. So you have to assess somebody's entire life medical experience medical history rather than just like it says right here their current situation that prior their whole entire medical their lifetime is more important than just right now so that 80 year old patient has to be addressed first primary before the healthy 35 year old and you can save both lives at the same time and still get it done all right feedback any kind of feedback brian I mean, this has been a good overview as to what's happening locally, just mm -hmm. on the ground floor as to what some of the concerns are during this stage of, uh, you know, the health crisis. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got. Okay. All right. So I really do appreciate you guys coming for me today. Um, I thank you guys. And again, I will continue to do the same thing next Sunday on May the 31st. Um, it's a lot to do. I'm on, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm still going to be doing interviews all over the city and posting it all over social media. And I have, I have to get this published too as well and get this, get this uh, CD out to people. Let people know what's going on in my opinion as a medical professional as well as uses towards my future nursing school or even medical school or PA school. There's a lot of opportunities available not for myself but also for other people as well. The main issue why I wanted to have this this briefing today is to pretty much help hospitals and medical staff understand you have to address the whole life like I said before the whole life situation of a person their prior priors okay as well as the COVID. You cannot block people from going to hospitals. You cannot have security and police officers blocking people access to hospitals just because they don't have coronavirus, COVID-19. There are other issues that are way more important to be addressed. Right now, the COVID-19 is a right now temporary emergency situation. 
but that should still receive the same level status as regular heart patients, um, lung cancer patients, uh, labor and delivery, pregnancy women. Pregnancy women should still see, receive the same priority level status as COVID patients. If I'm going through labor delivery, I should get priority status as well as a COVID patient because it's almost the same level of care. You still can't wait for, it's a life or death situation dealing with a pregnant woman. So we have to learn how to properly assess these patients and triage them correctly. And that is something that I hope you guys will help me to follow up discuss. Please follow up with your legislators, your congressmen, your assembly people, your, your government representatives, your councilmen, your city councilmen, your city leaders, go out there, talk to them as well as your doctors and your nurses and whoever is your point of care. Do not let a coronavirus stop you from getting emergency care. And telehealth care, as I said before, is not a substitute for, for preventive care. If you are going through an emergency situation, do not let that stop you from going to the hospital. Do not let a police officer stop you from going to the hospital and getting the care that you need and you deserve. All right, so this is LaQueen coming from Boston, Massachusetts. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Brian, do you have anything else to say? No. No, thank no. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, yeah. have a great evening. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. We're going to go ahead and cut it. Um, I'm going to stop the share here. Thank you, Brian. And I, I don't know how to stop this. How do I stop this? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Let's see. So you're just going to click end. And then end.